You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. American history is full of infamous people, places, and events like the Salem Witch Trials and the Black Sox baseball scandal, Alcatraz Prison and the Bermuda Triangle, D.B. Cooper and Bonnie and Clyde and Lee Harvey Oswald. I'm Chris Wimmer. Join me on the infamous America podcast for stories of some of the darker and more controversial chapters of American history, all told with cinematic music and sound design. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. Today, I'm happy to welcome back to the show the delightfully cheeky Mary Roach, who has been called the funniest science writer in the country. In her previous bestsellers, this award-winning author has done revealing scientific deep dives into what happens to our bodies during sex, when we're eating, when we die, and what happens after that. She's famous for answering the questions that we all secretly wonder, such as can a corpse get an erection, or how much do we have to eat for our stomach to burst? And now she's back to answer what's to be done about a jaywalking moose, a bear caught breaking and entering, a murderous tree, and other nature-related crimes and misdemeanors in her latest book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. Today, she comes on the show to discuss various animals that have stood trial in actual courts throughout history and how that inspired her latest book. She talks about traveling the globe from Reno to the Himalayas to attend an animal forensics conference, track down man-eating leopards, and blow up trees. Yes, Mary blew up a tree. Plus the time the U.S. military waged a war on birds, drunk elephants, monkey muggers, and much more. Coming up with Mary Roach in just a moment. Roach is the author of five best-selling works of nonfiction, most recently Grunt, The Curious Science of Humans at War. Her writing has appeared in Outside, National Geographic, and the New York Times Magazine, among other publications, and now she investigates the unusual encounters that happen when humans and animals intersect in her new book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. Mary, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Ben. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. And, you know, it's funny, the title makes me think of these many cases prior to the 20th century, or even in the early 20th century, I think, of animals who were criminally tried in actual human courts and punished, often lethally punished. You talk about that a little bit in the introduction. Some of these stories are just too absurd, and I've always found them fascinating. Do you have a favorite? I do have a favorite. There was the case, it was 1659, and it was in a province in northern Italy and Lombardy, in fact, which got uh, a lot of attention because in the early days of COVID, the rates were high. But anyway, going back to 1659, there was an infestation of caterpillars, which were eating the lettuces and plants, as, as caterpillars will do. And the locals um, posted summons on trees in the area, telling the caterpillars to appear in court on a set date, at which point they'd be assigned legal representation. <laughs> and when I saw this, this book, this is a, a book, a 1906 book that collects all these stories. And I initially thought this has to be a hoax, but it's very well documented. They've got the appendix as all these, you know, these in Latin, these, these um, transcripts and writs of ejectment and, and all kinds of just actual, it's, it's very well sourced is what I'm saying. It's not made up, but it seems made up. <laughs> but anyway, so, so yeah, the, uh, needless to say, the caterpillars did not turn up in court. They pupated as they, yeah, cat, caterpillars were due and the damage stopped. And I think all parties were satisfied uh, but it was bizarre. And there were a lot of cases of uh, pigs attacking small children. And I guess I, I don't associate pigs with with attacks on small children, but I guess that it was something that happened fairly often and the pigs would be executed. You know, wow. there, were, were, there, were, <laughs> there were hangings. Yes, as you said, and there was an, there was imprisonment. They would thrust legal documents into the burrows of, of rats, <laughs> telling them to leave. <laughs> it was, you know, and I, it wasn't that they were simple minded. It was more, I think that the way the author explained it was that it was this, the powers that be in these communities showing 
off saying, you know, we even have dominion over nature. Oh, we interesting. We can command. Yes, we <laughs> we make the rules and they apply to everyone, even the caterpillars. That's how strong we are. That's how important and powerful we are. So that's kind of how it, how it was explained, because otherwise it just seems daft. Did you really think the caterpillars were going to show up? And weevils, there were cases against weevils. and just, it, it, just the appendix, I mean, the index is quite amazing. You can go species by species. So that, and that was how I kind of got into this. That was one of the things I stumbled onto where I thought, obviously the law isn't the way to deal with this. Maybe, maybe science, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, at least back then, animals got their day in court. I mean, a lot of times today, we just put animals down. <laughs> they never get to put on a proper defense. But that's interesting that this sort of inspired this book, all of these ancient stories you know, from the 1600s and so forth of animal crimes, so to speak. Now, of course, sometimes animals do kill or they're suspected rightly or wrongly of killing a human being. That's when something called animal forensics comes into play. And now you attended an animal forensics training seminar in Reno that was put on by an agency, unfortunately, with the acronym WART. What is WART and what's that crowd like at one of these events? I can't even imagine. Yeah, uh, WART was amazing. They they invited me to come. WART stands for Wildlife Human Attack Response Training. So it was classwork and also field work with fake crime scenes. This is a predator attacking a human, killing a human. And these are the people who are the first responders who come on and secure the crime scene. I'm using crime in quotes here, uh, the crime scene, and try to figure out what happened what species, first of all, and then which individual animal, which is, it's great that they actually try to make sure and match the victim to the specific animal, because sometimes that's not clear. Sometimes they get the wrong species, sometimes they get the wrong bear, and that's not fair. So they do, uh, they do a fair amount of work in, in that realm, which I had no idea. This was all new to me. These are folks, they're, they're people who work for wildlife agencies, fish and game agencies up in Canada, where there's a lot of bears. They're called wildlife conservation officers, and they're they're great. They're really it's a it's a conference with these folks is first of all it's in a casino in Reno. It happened the the, the conference is annual and it's held in different places. It happened to be in this kind of rundown casino outside Reno, so that was kind of a surreal setting for a a, a predator attack scene training uh, weekend. They, but they were you know you'd be riding up in the elevator and some one guy would be saying to another like. Did you ever tase an elk? <laughs> they're, they're just a lot of great eavesdropping. Um, yeah, but. but it was really fascinating. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a forensics nerd, and this was a brand of forensics I wasn't familiar with. You know, just like, how do you how do you do this? Yeah, yeah. Now, we use crime in quotes here, but there, there are a lot of cases, or some cases, where People get away with murder because the investigators assume that it was the work of an animal or people end up wrongfully convicted and take the fall for the animal's actions, such as the famous dingo baby case. This can be pretty serious stuff. And now even DNA is getting into it, just as with other crimes. <laughs> uh, well, there, uh, like you mentioned, there's cases of uh, wrongful conviction. There was a case in which a, a cougar was assumed to have killed a man based on the, these puncture marks on the neck. And, and a cougar or mountain lion does typically kill with a bite to the neck. That is what they do. But the configuration wasn't right. I mean, to anybody who knows what that looks like, you know, it's a sort of telltale triangular puncture mark. These were not triangular. They weren't placed correctly. But anyway, they called it as a mountain lion attack. And that mountain lion, I don't know whether that lion was found and killed, but years later, this guy is serving who did it was with an ice pick in fact, was serving time for something else and bragged about getting away with that killing and uh, thought it was, you know, hilarious that they convicted a mountain lion. Right. Wow. Now, when you were spending time with Wart, you actually got into kind of uh, what, what kind of evasive techniques and safety techniques one would employ when dealing with a dangerous animal. And you actually spend a good amount of time dealing with bear incidents in this book, both petty crimes and capital offenses. Let me ask you, I was always told that you want to play dead if you run into a brown bear. And I forget what it is with a black bear. You want to look big and try and scare it off or something. I, although I may have that backwards. What is the real thing? No, you have that right. The ditty that, that people are told, uh, which I was told long ago, was if it's brown, lay down. If it's black, fight back. 
This isn't great advice because uh, a black bear, the species, the black bear, they're often brown. <laughs> and grizzlies are often very dark. So it's very hard to tell what you're dealing with if you don't know much about them. The best way to identify them is by the length of the claws. But if you're close enough for that to be something you can really make an assessment of, it's probably not going to be very helpful. Uh, what I was told by one of these folks who deal with this all the time up in Canada and BC, British Columbia, the most important thing is to distinguish what kind of attack it is. If it's a defensive attack, uh, it's usually like you've surprised a black bear, you've made it feel threatened. So it's going to try to be really scary. It's going to like come at you. It's a bluff charge. So it's going to just rush at you, look really scary, but not actually going to go all the way through and attack you. So and the ears will be forward where they won't be flat. They're, I mean, it might be difficult to kind of make that call <laughs> in, in that instance. But, you know, you try to stand your ground, just sort of talk calmly and back away. Like, I get it. You want me to back off. I'm backing off is sort of what you do with a bear. And a predatory attack is so uncommon with bears. They're just not, they don't stalk humans for food. <laughs> okay. Then, right. Don't they eat berries and um, stuff like that? Bears. <laughs> yeah. They're like aging hippies. They eat nuts and berries and, and, you know, honey and ants and grasses. They're not hunters of people. I mean, there are cases where what, the motive is kind of unclear. Like, why did that bear, you know, you find the, the person dead and it doesn't seem to have been food that they were after. I mean, there are cases where it, it seems to have happened, but it's really rare. Anyway, if it does seem to be coming at you, not just as a bluff and it has knocked you over and is trying to kill you, fight back. That's when you fight back. You know, go for the face, go for the eyes, just do, do whatever you can to show that you mean business. So you don't, you don't lie, don't lie down at that point. I mean, you know, you cover a lot of bear incidents, whether it's, you know, a mauling or just kind of nuisance situations, which happen as we start to encroach on their territory with development and so on. Is it safe to say that most of the bear incidents that happen are largely due to human error? I mean, we don't secure our trash bins. We leave our doors open. We don't know how to properly handle a bear encounter. We have the wrong kind of doors. Apparently, French doors are a bear's best friend. I mean, is a lot of it on us, really? Well, y yeah, there are so many things that you can do or forget to do. Like the, the French doors, they call them, the French doors have the handles that you just push it down and then push the door. A uh, bear can do that really easily. Uh, the building codes in bear country, for example, Pitkin County in Colorado, where Aspen is, you know, which is a, it's a ski area. So they're up in the mountains there in bear country and bear break-ins are amazingly common. And uh, the building code tells you not to use French handles. They call them bear handles. Uh, and even uh, those hollow doorknobs, because the bears can crush them in their teeth and then turn the knob. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really? Um, yeah. And um, bears love automatic doors, you know, in stores. Yeah, there have been cases oh, of sure. bears just walking right on in. The door opens up. The bear goes into the ski resort or the store. Um, sometimes it's people being just not bothering to secure things or, or ha you know, le leaving food out like dog food on a deck or a bird feeder. There, there's They call them attractants. And uh, it may be that somebody's not aware of it. And there are definitely cases where people are aware of it and they just don't bother. And then they've got a bear in their garage or their kitchen. I mean, there's bear, they'll come into the kitchen or just, you know, open the fridge and take things out. So a lot of it is preventable. And there's, you know, when I look at, there's lists of the fatal bear attacks in North America. You can find that list online. And over and over, it's, it's, you can see that it was a crime of opportunity. Somebody had food in their tent or someone, uh, often uh, dogs are involved. That's not really, that's not the person's fault per se, but the, you know, the dog smells the bear, the, the bear feels threatened, the two kind of go at it. To a certain extent, the person tries to intervene. And then what can happen is called, I learned this at Wart, attack redirection. So the bear was focused on the dog and suddenly sees you and you get caught in the melee uh, and it doesn't take long to get severely injured when a bear is on the other side of it. Yeah. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is it's always the animal that gets punished, not the humans. Uh, although you do talk to someone who issues uh, citations for not keeping your trash locked up, you know, against the bears. But, you know, most of the time what happens if there's a violent incident, either the animal gets removed in the best case scenario somewhere deeper into the wilderness, which presents its own problems, apparently. But more often than not, they get put down. 
And you spent quite a bit of time actually in India, of all places, where 500 people a year die from elephant encounters, but they take a very different approach. So I'm wondering if you could maybe contrast this American catch-and-kill approach to wildlife with India's what they call a namaste and please go away philosophy. Yeah, that, that's why I went to India. It was, a, it was a different mindset. Here, if a bear harms a person, not just breaks in or, or raids the trash, if, a, if it harms a person, it, it is put down. And that's true in Canada as well. And India, they're more lenient, uh, specifically the leopards. There are leopard attacks, like predatory attacks up in the middle Himalayas. For various reasons, it's becoming more common there. But they wait till there's a certain number of kills before they intervene. And they uh, sometimes will take the animal and just put it, sort of put it in a, kind of put it in prison. So it's not a death sentence, it's a prison sentence. So the, the, that may happen sometimes. But with the elephants, part of this it comes down to uh, Hinduism, because with elephants, I mean, the elephant, the, the, the god Ganesh is, is an elephant. I mean, I don't know if you call it the avatar, but anyway, it's a, it's a, the, the elephant is a deity animal. So it, it is has a lot of reverence and a a lot of positive feelings associated with it. This is also true with the macaques, the monkeys that do a lot of mischief and and breaking into people's homes and stealing things and just really irritating people a a great deal. But they're, uh, because of Hanuman, the monkey god, they have a reverence. They actually give them food. They feed them. It's like an offering to them. So yeah, it's a, it's a different mindset, it, but, but, Still, the, you know, these are for the people who are the recipients of these actions, particularly the leopards, they sometimes they'll take matters into their own hands if their family members are being killed. So sometimes there's sort of a vigilante um, approach that happens um, with, the, with the leopards. With the elephants, it's, it's uh, as you said, namaste, please go away. They're, they're more patient. They're more tolerant. The government has a compensation scheme. So if you're if you're Crops are trampled by elephants. If, if there's damage that's done by the elephant you or someone is killed, they, there's a payment, like a lump sum from the government. Or well, that's the plan. Yeah, I don't know how prompt they are in carrying that out, but that is, that's, that's their um, approach there rather than straight away killing the animal. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more when we return in just a minute. We have one goal on the Investing for Beginners podcast, and that's to spread education and foundational investing knowledge to all listeners of all backgrounds. If you're looking for eye-opening guest interviews, simplistic breakdowns on current market conditions, and teaching of core investing concepts, you've come to the right place. If you're anything like us, the hardest part of investing was getting started, and that's why we're here. The Investing for Beginners podcast is focused on laying the educational groundwork to teach you how to invest your money to work for you and to allow you to jumpstart your financial independence journey. Subscribe to the Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. I travel through time to tell you this. Almost everything that happens in politics today has happened before, has been debated before, maybe in slightly different forms. On My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast, since 2006, I've been examining the history behind today's politics and adding layers of context to some of today's debates and telling some great stories. I'm Bruce Carlson. Join me at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com or wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever else you get your podcasts from. Learn how George Washington and FDR supported vaccines in their time. Warren Harding or Ulysses S. Grant took stands on racial justice. John and Abigail Adams and what they had to say about free speech and the press. What Abraham Lincoln had to say on that. What were the conspiracy theories that had to be debated during the debate over the Constitution? Were things more partisan or less partisan in the past? We're balanced on My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, so I promise you won't be infuriated even if you don't agree. We take a balanced approach. So listen, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Well, I was interested to read that one problem that India has that we don't have here is uh, drunk elephants. Now, I just have so many questions here. How do they get drunk? What kind of drunk are they? If drunk humans have hallucinations about pink elephants, then what do drunk <laughs> elephants see? <laughs> like, I have to I ask know. more about this. Uh, the drunk elephants, how do they get drunk? 
they do love a snort, the elephants. They like they like booze. And some of the farmers will do their own sort of homegrown. It's homebrew called haria. It's homebrew made with some grain. And, and, it, and, it, and in order to keep the elephants from breaking into the pot, they bring it into their home. Now the elephants will be like, I can knock that wall down, no problem, because <laughs> the elephants smell it. You know, it's alcohol, it's fermenting, it's very odoriferous. So there's there's cases where people have been home sleeping and suddenly this elephant comes through the wall. These are not very well constructed homes, I should point out. But the elephant, you know, knocks down the wall to get to the hooch. And the in the process, people have been uh, injured or killed. I saw, there was a paper about elephants drink alcohol and elephants and they, when they get drunk, they tend to, for the most part, they're kind of a pleasant drunk. They wander off on their own and lie down, or they wrap their trunk around themselves. I liked that one. Or they kind of sway back and forth. Um, but there are uh, aggressive drunks. The lead matriarch elephant of the herd can get aggressive. As uh, Also, you, you don't want to be around a, a male elephant in must, which is that sort of a testosterone crazed period where you definitely want to steer clear under any circumstances, but particularly a drunk elephant in must, M-U-S-T-H, I think it is. I read somewhere, and I don't know if this is true because this was not a, a paper that I'd come across, but somewhere else I read that they don't have the enzyme that you need to break down the alcohol so they're an easy drunk. Like it takes less than you would think. An elephant's huge. You would think it would take a you know 50-gallon drum, but it's not as much alcohol as you would think. I think the amount is somewhere in the book. Well, I have to go back to the macaques then. Um, on a scale of animal crimes, uh, there's also a ton of petty theft and misdemeanor, such as these macaques of Delhi. How much of a nuisance have they become? Apparently, they even sort of ransom people. <laughs> They're basically doing muggings and then ransoming valuables for food, right? <laughs> yes, they do. They they work in gangs, so they're a little intimidating. I was mugged by a macaque, but we can get to that later. Yeah, you know, they're very quick. They come out of nowhere and they grab your glasses, your sunglasses or your cell phone. And then uh, if you're if you live around where there are macaques, you know what to do, which is you get some fruit or some soda pop or so just something sweet and tasty. You hold it out and then the macaque will drop your phone and take the, the what you're trading for. It's you're the ransom. Basically, it's it's um, they, they they'll ransom your phone. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And apparently there's quite a trade in sensationalist monkey stories among kind of tabloid press in India, which makes me think of like, I don't know, a few years ago, remember the monkey man was a thing for a while and it turned out to be a myth. And The monkey man is bizarre. It was like viral hallucinations or something. That was, yeah, I wanted to do a story on that, but I never did. But uh, the monkey man, yeah. But the, but the macaques, the, the headlines are kind of like, some of them were like macaques marching in armies from here to there. You know, there there was a story that a, the macaque had stoned a man to death in, in, in one tabloid. But then you looked at another, a little bit less sensationalistic news account. The man had been napping outdoors near a pile of bricks. The macaques ran over the pile of bricks, started a cavalcade of rocks or bricks, I'm not sure. Anyway, which fell upon the man. So he wasn't stoned. <laughs> he <laughs> died by stones hitting him, many of them from a height. But uh, he wasn't like, because you imagine this like biblical thing with a bunch of macaques like throwing rocks at this person. It seems not to have been the case. There was this epidemic of like, at least five different stories over the years of people falling from their balconies because of macaques, which, which uh, uh, that famously the, the mayor of Delhi died that way, he was out on his balcony. A bunch of macaques uh, leaked down onto the balcony to get access to go in, you know, through the, the, the balcony doors. But he apparently, I don't think there was an eyewitness, but he tried to fight them off or keep them out or else just lost his balance, but he fell off the balcony. There was one that was quite horrifying as far as I could tell is true, a macaque snatching a baby that was breastfeeding. So they're yeah they they get into a lot of mischief and make people miserable and the city you know, try the city doesn't deal with it very well it's not an easy thing to deal with I mean what they do now is uh, pay monkey catchers to relocate them to this sort of sanctuary in the south, southern part of the city uh, but they but it's very hard to hire monkey catchers because of the religious overtones and uh, nobody wants to be the person doing. Not that it's necessarily harmful for to, to catch the monkey and, and take it to this preserve, but uh, it just has a bad 
He said, what do you do for a living? I trap monkeys. Ugh. Well, uh, another portion of the book is dedicated to bird-related problems, of which there are many, apparently. There's obviously, like, the crows eating farmers' crops. And one thing that I learned in your book is that scarecrows really aren't that effective and may even attract crows because crows then associate them with the crops and the food. <laughs> but beyond the scarecrow, there have been some pretty creative and bizarre attempts at crow deterrence, including, wait for it, folks, crow bombing. <laughs> How long was this a thing in the U.S. and was it effective, crow bombing? Crow bombing, the early part of the last century, crow bombing was in the 30s and 40s, maybe up through the 50s. Crow bombing was kind of what it sounds like. Crows and blackbirds and th these birds have huge roosting areas. They, they settle down in these stands of trees and there'll be thousands of them spending the night. And then they go off in the day to eat the farmer's crops, <laughs> which pisses the farmers off. So what some of these communities were doing, with the help of the people who, who had titles like wildlife conservation, they would uh, string up these uh, homemade dynamite, you know, dynamite in an ice cream carton or whatever. They, they string of dynamite through the trees during the day while the birds were gone. And then when they come back to roost, uh, setting it off and you know, killing thousands of crows at once. There was a, there was a paper where they had they had statistics um, between it was a nineteen thirty something to forty something three point eight million birds were killed and it had no effect on the population in, at large or the amount of agricultural damage or the populations of uh, ducks because part of why people were pissed at the crows is there was a belief that they were eating duck eggs and there wouldn't be enough ducks for the hunters to shoot. <laughs> Like, no, we want to, oh, we want to kill those. Um, <laughs> so uh, it doesn't work on top of being a brutal thing. I mean, because the, the number of birds that were not killed instantly, but just maimed it was a huge number. It was a ghastly scene. But uh, but yeah, it was it was it was a thing. <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting what you mentioned a moment ago, how, you know, a lot of times wildlife conservationists and, you know, a lot of these state fish and wildlife departments make the bulk of their money from hunting licenses. And you describe how even their offices are inevitably always decked out in animal trophies. Do you think it's a little hypocritical that the very people charged with protecting both the people and the animals are also so deeply tied to the killing of animals? Well, it just dates back to the origins of, of conservation, wilderness conservation. It was an effort to, to set aside large, beautiful tracts of land for hunting. And I mean, it sounds kind of barbaric and it is sort of ironic, but there, there are parts of California where in the middle of the state, there are these wetlands where birds stop over incredible numbers of snow geese and gadwalls and dozens of kind of ducks. That's an amazing place for bird watching, but it's also, uh, uh, there are hunting lodges and duck hunters and people who go to hunt there. So, the, and it's been preserved for hunting, but it's also something that's enjoyed by hikers and bird watchers. And it was funny, I was out there with someone from California, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And as I left this area of these just beautiful wetlands that really, this was what California once looked like. And the, you drive out of there and it becomes just flat out agriculture. It is just boring, flat crops. And, and so I, I felt kind of a debt of thanks to these hunters who had set aside this land, although they take, I mean, and it's just huge, huge numbers of birds that the take by the hunters is, is fairly inco inconsequential. So it's kind of a tricky, yeah, it is an irony that wilderness and wildlife conservation is so closely tied and funded by hunting and fishing, licenses and taxes on gear. And there's been a movement to, to separate that funding so that there, there's money from the government to support conservation. And so you're know, trying to kind of um, make wildlife conservation and management a little more independent of the hunting. But yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. It, it, it is bizarre that, that that's how it came about. And the history of conservation is fascinating. Uh, on the flip side of that, not surprisingly, under Pope Francis, the Vatican has taken a decidedly benevolent and progressive approach to, for instance, their seagull problem. Yes, the Vatican has a seagull problem. <laughs> You folks can read it in your book, and other nuisance creatures within their boundaries. But that apparently doesn't apply to rodents. You spoke to someone over there, and they, quote, 
have to do an action against rats, meaning, I assume, killing them. And this led to this fascinating philosophical discussion between you and an official from the Pontifical Academy for Life about when it's okay to kill. That poor guy. Could you just tell that he so didn't want to be having that conversation with you? He was so patient, Father Carlo Casaloni of the Pontifical Academy for Life, kind of a think tank, Catholic Church think tank and policy making organ. And it's it, what I love about the Pontifical Academy for Life is that even though it's outside the boundaries of Vatican City, it's down about four blocks down from the border of Vatican City in Rome. When you are in the PAL, you are in the Vatican, even though it's outside, it's inside. And so it's a, it's on this weird transubstantiation. So, yeah, well, well, see, I was there anyway, and I thought, well, now that I'm, since I'm here, I've, what I wanted to do was talk to the Pope himself, but of course I got nowhere. It um, managed to get an interview with somebody from the Pontifical Academy for Life, and, um, the, and the, the media manager was incredibly welcoming. He's like, yeah, absolutely, we would love to, and he sent me some writings uh, from, you know, the encyclical about the importance of conservation that, that Pope Francis had written, and so we sat down to have this conversation, and, uh, you know, he, he was talking about St. Francis, and he was a friend to all the animals, and he referred to them as, you know, sister moon and brother deer, and I said, and what about Brother Rat. Did he talk about Brother Rat? He's like, <laughs> no, I don't know. What? <laughs> and I was like, is it okay? Is it, is it okay to kill a rat? You know, I was, I was, so I, I was just a very annoying presence in his day, but he had, you know, he had lovely answers for all of my questions. Yeah. And, and apparently the Vatican uses lasers against seagulls. People can look that up in the book. I know we're running out of time. Now, all of these measures seem to focus on things like population reduction, lethal measures, relocation, hazing, apparently, as well. But it's rare to hear someone actually talk about just learning to live with animals in our shared space. We're the ones who are encroaching on animals' habitat, after all, not the other way around. So is there a case to be made for humans just learning to get better at coexisting with animals? Absolutely, yeah. I think we're too quick to, you know, we see a wild animal, especially in urban areas where, you know, you see an animal, you think, oh, what is that doing there? I don't want it there. It's a pest. You know, I, I'd like to get rid of it. And you call somebody to do that and they trap it and take it away. And, and you don't want to think about it. Like, what is it, what's going to happen to that animal? Well, probably not going to be a, a lovely end. And you, there are people, there are wildlife control operators who do humane things. Like if, an, you know, you've got an animal in your attic that's keeping you awake at night and possibly chewing on the wires, that's it, understandably you want that out of there. Not killed, though. I mean, speaking for myself. And this is a problem you dealt with personally, I think, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I think we all would do well to first start with asking, is there some way to, to coexist here? Could we uh, figure out where the animal's getting in and block that hole and just have the animal uh, around out in the yard? For example, the roof rat that I encountered uh, in the book, uh, in my yard, in, on my deck and later inside the walls. There, if you can figure out using a wildlife camera, you know, how is it getting in? Uh, you, there's, you can plug those holes with various things like steel wool that they can't gnaw through. There's products for that. There's people who can help you with it. But a one-way door, so the, if there's a squirrel with babies, the squirrel goes out, you know, so that you're not plugging up the holes with the babies inside and the squirrel outside. There's people who come and put a one-way door, and then and then they, you know they'll trap the animal, but then just let it go in your yard, not not taking it somewhere where it has no idea where it is, where it's in some other animal's terrain. So there's a lot you can, yeah, a lot you can do, and also just I remember. I went to hike with a friend that day. I saw that rat run across the deck. A roof rat is a pretty cute animal also, I should say. It's not like a sewer rat. It's about, it's essentially a squirrel with a naked tail. Very cute. But I said, I told my friend Cynthia, I saw a roof rat on the deck because we, you know, in Oakland, in the areas that have trees, we are seeing, we had sort of a spike in the roof rat population. And she said, is that a problem? Like she just was like, what's so what? And I was like, yeah, you're you're right. Well, then eventually, of course, it got into the wall and it did become a problem, but one that we solved. But I, I, I think the bigger problem is when animals interfere with the livelihood of somebody, a, a rancher or a farmer, who, and there, you know, there's an emotional component. If you know, if you raise sheep for a living, and you know, sheep are kind of your world, and and you've got a coyote or a wolf taking sheep, you know, it, it, it's not just your livelihood; it's also an emotional thing, and it's it's tough to kind of judge. It's hard for me to judge those folks not knowing what that world is like. 
but uh, that what's what is a good thing is that there have been there are a number of coexistence carnivore human coexistence organizations that try to bring groups together. You know, r- ranchers, farmers, even backyard chicken breeders. You know, p- people bring so get, just to like to have conversations and to think about solutions rather than just calling wildlife services to have them killed. Good news is the wildlife services is in in 10 or 12, I think, states is hiring non-lethal specialists, not just to pay lip service to non-lethal solutions, but to do some of them, like range riders and people who, you know, help you build safer nighttime enclosures so that coyotes or mountain lions or wolves don't take your animals. So so there so that culture within wildlife services, that's the USDA's kind of people who go out and help ranchers deal with these problems, quote unquote problem. And surprisingly, some of these ranchers are pretty open-minded. You wouldn't think that. You spoke to one, or or a farmer, I guess, maybe not a rancher, who uh, it was kind of just like, you know, rats happen, it's a farm, you know, and the shrinkage is not that big a deal. So much gets blown away by the wind, so... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Mary, this is just such a fun read. I really recommend it to people. And by the way, I should mention that your books always have the weirdest and most fascinating footnotes. As soon as I finish your book, I always go back to reread the footnotes because I'm just one of those people who loves lists of weird facts like that. (laughs) And there's one especially about Mussolini in there that I love, and I'll let people find that on their own. But uh, (laughs) that's right. Yeah, see, he used uh, castor oil as a torture device, basically leading to people shitting themselves to death. Yeah, the footnotes are always very fun. That's just me indulging myself. It was like, I, I can't leave this out. This has to go in somewhere. (laughs) I love it. Well, the book is called Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. Mary Roach, it's always a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much, Ben. It was fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Mary Roach for coming on the show. Order her new book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law, on Amazon, Audible, or wherever books are sold. Follow Mary on Twitter at at Mary underscore Roach or at Mary Roach Net. If you enjoyed today's episode, then subscribe and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Detailed reviews are the best way for new listeners to discover the show. Follow us on Facebook at at Kickass News Pod and email me with your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickassnews.com. Kickass News is a part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com and check out some of our other shows like Food with Mark Bittman, Movie Therapy, Investing for Beginners, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, and many others. For now, though, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass News. Airwave Media Podcast.